I've been in Somerville for 20 years, and I'm one of the founders of the Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership. And part of what we do is air pollution research, and we've been strong advocates for the green light. I've known Ellen for 20 years. <laughs> I, 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 I'm on, I was on lots of lots of mural committees from the transfer fee stuff in 1995, 1998, to uh, to some of the some of the Union Square stuff. And, and I'm an educator retired. I just go to meetings and make trouble. And what's your name, strange? Joe Beckman. <laughs> <laughs> I almost forgot it. So uh, yeah, that's a good sign. <laughs> Um, I'm Lynn Doncaster, uh, writer and hybrid artist, uh, lifelong Somerville resident, um, fighting getting priced out and currently in the crosshairs of uh, the condo conversion law. Uh, <coughs> may have to leave where I am in 30 days. Found out last night. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's another story. I'll pass. That's a piece of this story. On the other hand, you work for a crusading newspaper that's not going to let that happen. So <laughs> <laughs> that's um, right. Um, right. I know we have we have someone else joining us. There's handouts right up front, <coughs> right, up right there, and we're just doing a go around. We just started, so hey. <laughs> so um, I'm Jason Pramus. Uh, I have titles. I'm, I'm with Dig Boston and uh, Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, um, and I, I I think you all know who I am. So I'll, I'll just uh, why I'm doing this. I think so. Call you Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Hi, I'm, I'm Kate Byrne, um, and I'm basically sitting here in um, the, for the seat of the Community Action Agency of Somerville. Cool. Bill Cavallini, I'm involved with uh, Union Square Redevelopment. Um, I'm co-chair of the Union Square Neighborhood Council, and I was at the first session where Kate and I are residents of Somerville for the last 15 years. We live on Oak Street. Uh, I'm Vincent Gabriel. I'm uh, a new transplant to Somerville, <coughs> uh, a freelance journalist, and I missed the first session because I was under deadline, so I'm now. I'm Lynx Mitchell. I'm a freelance writer, and I'm interested in doing more stories on Somerville. I'm Richard Shore. I live in West Somerville. I'm interested in uh, issues being discussed and communicated within the City of Somerville, so I'm interested in communications. But my primary interests are housing and uh, the Tufts uh, pilot agreement and uh, traffic safety <laughs> and uh, improving Somerville. I live on Packard Avenue. Hi, my name is Larry Yu. Uh, I live in Davis Square. Um, I apologize for being late. Uh, I am a uh, communications consultant and I have so I have a great interest in uh, news and media. Um, and I am also, I attended the first uh, summit uh, representing the Climate Coalition of Somerville. I'm a climate advocate and an activist. We, we, we yeah, started yeah, yeah. 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 thought I was going to miss the introduction no. by coming out late. I'm Joe Lynch. I'm president of the board of directors of the Somerville Media Center. Cool. Okay. So, I mean, um, the format that we laid out for this is straightforward. Um, we we're just going to run through these proposals and, and just discuss each in turn. Um, I will say at the outset, and I mean, the, you know, the proposals were, were meant to be about um, improving and expanding news coverage in Somerville. And I, you know, I, could, I would sort of group these pretty easily into, into two, you know, sort of subgroups. You know, this, I think four proposals are, are for, um, um, creating media about particular issues that are going on in town and then the other two proposals are, are sort of broader you know let's let's um, figure out how we're producing more news in the city in general so that's fine um, so I mean uh, I just have them in order and um, hopefully the people that put them out are here to present them um, by which I mean just literally read it you know go through it the way you were planning to extemporize if you wish um, we have you know, the total of six proposals, so we have plenty of time by 2 o'clock, even starting a little bit late, to, um, to get through them. Give them about 15 minutes each, 20 minutes each. Um, and if we, if, if we go faster than that, uh, we could just have a general discussion until people get sick of it <laughs> and move along. So um, uh, about uh, news in the city, um, kind of jumping off where we left off with the summit. 
uh, someone else joins us while I speak. <laughs> and who are you? Hi, my name is Christina Deweese. Um, I mean, sorry, I'm out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a co-chair for the Somerville Commission for Women, and I cool. was really excited about the event. Great. Um, so I'll pass around a sign and sheet once I feel like everybody's definitely here. Um, <laughs> yes. um, but um, uh, do we have someone to do the Union Square Neighborhood Council uh, programming proposal? Uh, we do not. Um, I mean, I could speak to questions about it. But I was not involved with Gary in, pu in, in putting the proposal forward. Right. So I, I don't, I mean, I, I, <laughs> read, it, so I read the summary of it and so on. He so emailed me, so I think he's coming. So maybe we should just skip yeah. it. And, you know, okay. Okay. he shows up, we can do it. Um, Larry's here. So oh, yeah. Okay. Why did you do your presentation? <laughs> well, I did a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you. Yes. So, uh, well, I won't just read the. I'll just. I'll talk more broadly about it, and we can talk about some of the details. Um, <coughs> so, um, so I'm proposing something roughly called Green's Summerwell Media, but that's really just a placeholder name. <coughs> very catchy. Uh, don't hold me to that. Um, the premise of this proposal is that Somerville is really at a critical moment in uh, in addressing its sustainability. It has uh, sustainability goals. Uh, set for 2050, as, and it has just published its uh, Somerville Climate Forward Plan, uh, which is a climate action plan. It, um, it is also uh, at a critical moment for redevelopment for some of the largest districts in Somerville to be redeveloped. So it's, it's kind of a now or never moment for the city. Um, and, um, and, and yet, I, I don't think it's really part of the broader conversation within Somerville. Um, so I'm proposing something that really tells that story talks about some of the different things going on in the city, but really frames things around the city, the people in the city. So telling the stories of people who are trying to transform their, their houses and using that as kind of a central, transform their houses or businesses or, or lifestyles, mm -hmm. and using that as a central, um, a central part of the platform for a new uh, kind of media channel, I suppose. Um, one way to do that, uh, which I kind of outlined in, in a couple of bullets, is is to do kind of a this old house story uh, kind of approach yeah. to telling uh, a story over time of, in, in this example, perhaps a, a homeowner uh, trying to address different aspects of their house. Um, and it gives it a very personal feel. Um, and it's a very human feel and hopefully relatable to other people. Um, uh, you know, around that, there would probably be conversations about, you know, why this is why they're doing this something going on in the city maybe some timely news reporting on things going on around the city uh, and and the state um, and and I think there's an underlying idea here that um, that this this channel could be, could also be used to catalyze some new initiatives within the city um, for example have the city uh, itself do you know um, negotiate some new uh, new agreements with some contractors similar to what they did with Solarize to put solar panels on people's roofs or HeatSmart, CoolSmart to put um, uh, air source heat pumps in people's homes where they negotiated kind of discount deals with, with a few contractors. So they could do things like that. They could pilot other aspects of the climate action plan and use this as a channel to both pilot things as well as um, as well as grow new initiatives as well and new collaborations as well with different people in the city um, um, Green and Open Somerville and Somerville Climate Action have been doing depaving parties, so perhaps this is a way to kind of scale that and bring that to people's homes. Maybe you bring the green team from Groundwork Somerville to uh, do some planting in that yard at the same time. Um, so you can really build connections and community um, throughout the city. Um, I think I I had this is this is really just not even half baked, perhaps a quarter baked, but um, I, I was kind of considering this, you know, the, the, using the, this old house analogy, I was considering this to be on video so that you could capture the homes and, and really sort of <coughs> capture the people. So there would probably perhaps be a video channel uh, uh, developed uh, you know, through the web, um, but also, you know, build a kind of a news portal around that um, for sustainability issues within, within Somerville. I'll stop there. Yep, good. I think this is a really interesting idea, and I think it could be very beneficial. But one thing that I, um, I live in East Somerville, and my neighbors are very skeptical about a lot of these initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, 
that some of them don't have a lot of money to spend, but also they're just like, well, why should I, you know, depave my yard? I mean, what's the benefit for me? Mm -hmm. And I have, like, for example, I have a neighbor whose basement floods all the time. Yeah. So thinking about ways to kind of convey information that would say to someone, well, maybe this would be a solution to a problem that I have would be really helpful. Because I think, for example, it's, it's really difficult. I've been looking into putting in solar panels, and I've talked to a number of different companies, and it, the more I talk to them, the more confused I've gotten mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the pros and cons <coughs> of different approaches they want to take. So I haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself somewhat sophisticated, but the more <laughs> I learn, the more confused I get. So I think that, th I love your idea, but I also think we need to, it would be great to build in some, some kinds of things that people would think about as they're looking at this, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that would be really, really helpful to try to get p more people engaged in, in those kinds of activities. So, so I love, if I could respond to that very quickly, I mean, I, I love the example that you gave because that's, that was kind of one of the genesis um, <coughs> points for, for this proposal, this idea was um, someone, Renee Scott from Green and Open Summerhill was talking about how it would be awesome to have kind of a, a team of people from the community who, who are kind of experts, whether they're contractors or they've gone through this experience um, before, who would, who would sort of go to a house and, um, and, and be kind of like a mass save inspector um, around different aspects of, the, of their property. And, and one of the key things around depaving was, of course, flooding in, the, in, the, in basements. How do you control the water? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not an expert in that at all, so I can't advise. But but if you bring the right people in to do this, and, and they say, well, you know what, you, you do need, you would need to regrade this, or you know, uh, d do something else to capture rainwater off your gutters, then um, then you could you could sort of wrap that into the um, into what that homeowner does. But then you're telling the story on video, so other people can see. Oh, actually. <coughs> just depaving the driveway doesn't necessarily lead to more basement flooding. In fact, it can help control the water and, and you know, put in a, you know, whether a French drain is needed or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and I think the same thing is true with solar panels. And I, I, know I haven't put solar panels in because I'm, I'm confused about, well, I also have tree cover and that's sort of holding me back a little bit. Um, but just all the different options and the, the way to do it. And then, you know, who are the right installers? Because that's, you know, you know there are some scam installers out mm -hmm. there, so you know it's hard to know who to trust. Um, I would echo what Ellie said. Um, you know, on our street, no one has solar panels. A lot of a lot of uh, paved uh, side yards and and so on. Um, and you know, Ward Two, that section of Ward Two is is very similar to East yeah. Somerville in, in a lot of ways. Um, so. I would echo what she said, uh, that, that some down-earth kind of video um, stuff having to do with, you know, how you make those kind of decisions, which, tr makes <coughs> which pushes you towards making those kind of decisions would be helpful. The other thing that I think is important about what you're proposing is that um, probably the most <coughs> dramatic changes that could be made uh, to affect some of those readiness for what we have coming <coughs> is in the new transformational developments. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the developers of, <coughs> of Assembly Row and Union Square are really resistant to doing anything dramatic. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important, I think, to um, show that the, 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 the people of Somerville, other than those that are going to be living in those two areas, <coughs> are actually taking steps so that they said, we're doing it, why can't you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That Excellent. kind of thing. Why can't you do your share? And the things that they can do are pretty dramatic, sure. yeah. um, since yeah. they're starting from scratch. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah. Just that's it. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, I will talk okay. more about what I'm going to. What my I'm on the list for a talk or two, so yeah. that I'll talk later. But but I think the more the most the two issues that I see really important for your initiative, one is that Somerville is a good bellwether city. 
putting it online, there, the things we do can be replicated or changed or 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 controver I mean, can be con positively controversial in lots of other places. And um, I think a YouTube channel is a very wise idea, frankly, or something like that. And uh, and we also have a batch of kids who are technically capable of doing that. The second thing. <coughs> That I want to raise is that uh, about ten years ago, I did. I, ha I was with this. With the, I consulted with the school system, and they did video portfolios, multimedia portfolios, and that's gradually with faded from their from their their literacy. But the truth is, their their media literacy is almost more important now than their, than, than their <coughs> verbal literacy. And the more we can the more we can reinforce that with you, the better. Uh, I'll talk more about the housing stuff that I'm interested in. And I just wanted to add to the statement that um, that you had made too. I really um, I'm glad you brought that up about the developments coming in and how a lot of times with sustainability. And I really love this idea. And um, I think it's great to focus on what people can do, citizens. But then it's also really important to focus on the fact that what's really affecting climate change are large companies and the type of pollution that they're doing. So mm -hmm. having a counterpoint to that like for example like Puma is coming in which I feel like we haven't into speaking in general about news I haven't heard that much about like mm -hmm. that deal what that looked like but that's I can maybe Where? bring that up later Where's Puma coming? Um, assembly. to assembly and I, I mean that, about that. Yep. Uh -huh. it was in the news Jason Dang. <laughs> 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 I think you catch everything <laughs> oh, no, no, it's fine. I, I thought that they didn't, it was covered kind of quickly. I mean, maybe I missed it. Like, maybe there was other more in-depth articles, but I definitely, I mean, Puma is a huge, huge company, and clothes <coughs> are, the manufacturing of clothes and shoes apparel mm -hmm. is one of the biggest polluters. So what can we do, you know, as a city and stuff, so kind of, like, taking both angles, like the personal, but then also how can we hold <coughs> companies accountable? Mm -hmm. And that could be an interesting thing to also record via like the YouTube channel idea, via podcasts of like what it takes to kind of create those types of proposals. It could be an interesting way to get more people involved, so yeah. Sure, um, I I, you just reminded me of something. One of the things that's kind of interesting is although you're right about assembly not doing the right thing in many cases, Partners Healthcare, which built those buildings, which are ra rather ugly in my opinion. <laughs> However, they're totally environmentally sustainable. They've designed <coughs> them to be sustainable and to, pr to be, they That's put all their, um, you know, equipment that normally is on the first floor is up on the roof because of, you know, uh, flooding. flooding and things like that. And they have rain gardens and things like that on their properties. It would also be useful to, s to show examples of good design. They did the same thing at the new Spalding Hospital um, in Charlestown. So there are really some good examples. And I think <coughs> industry needs, people need to know so that when you go and go to these community meetings and they try to snow you with all this wonderful mm -hmm. stuff they're doing, you can say, well, why don't you do what Partners is doing? Mm -hmm. you know, they're, I mean, they're not, they're not in it to be wonderful people. They're doing it for their own reasons, but, but the fact is it's, it's good for the community. So I would add that. Uh, I can, as a sidebar, I can give you some news on, on Puma if, if, if you'd like, but, uh, but I love this idea of bringing large companies in, and uh, particularly Puma, uh, which has started to engage the community. Um, I, I guess one other, one question, I, I mean, I, I'm getting, Good feedback that this is something that, mm -hmm. that mm. kind of should exist yeah. in the world. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the other aspect of that is is of course how do you uh, how do you bring the right media resources to be able to make this happen in the world, um, and that's 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 to me is the trickier part. Is this a business? Is this part of part of a, an existing media outlet? Is this something that we need to build from scratch? Is this something that's all volunteer? There's a very juicy RFP coming out from the, from Tufts Health Plan, and Tufts is in trouble. I'll, I'll talk more about the pilot stuff later, but Tufts is in enough trouble to extract quite a lot of money out of them. And there are two RFPs, one in July and one and one in September. Tufts Health Plan Foundation, good web page to surf and dig around in. My guess is that we can develop several proposals to them, because you'll find Tufts is in some serious budget problems, and the way to solve it, frankly, is to invest in community resources. 
I will, of course, remind people that this is going to be broadcast, so, you know. <laughs> but um, um, I think, Larry, that, you know, I mean, Somerville Media Center and then my, my group, you know, the nonprofit, particularly Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, are, are going to be talking about, you know, well, within our proposals are, are contained, you know, the idea of leveraging resources for people to do this stuff. Um, but um, one reason I wanted to do this um, talk today, you know, this discussion today, the way the way we're doing it is precisely because perhaps you, you want to make a company out of it or do whatever, and that's, that's obviously fine. Um, any approach that people think will work, I think should be tried, you know, to like, expand the amount of, first of all, information available for people about issues of the day that they need to know about um, from, you know, any active perspective. Um, and then uh, the journalists, you know, either existing journalists or journalists that we train, you know, through the programs that SMC and us will be talking about, um, can then do the whole news thing, can do the, you know, like, well, is this really good? Is it bad? Whatever. Um, have people debate about it, you know, on shows, that kind of stuff. But, um, and, and, you know, curate it and get it out to a larger audience. So, um, um, but my, uh, my partners, uh, Chris Ferrone and John Loftus, uh, really like this one. Uh, I mean, we like all of them, but we, we thought this one is a really good concept. It's based on a concept that's done very well, you know, uh, this old house, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and stuff like depaving, I'm particularly interested in, because I didn't even know that that was going on here now, right? <coughs> and I walk around, you know, I, I live in Cambridge, for those of you who don't know, I've been trying to live in Somerville for a long time. <laughs> it's weird, you know, unicorn apartment, like we're in this basement apartment, you know, that we can't beat the rate of it, but it's too dinky and we'd rather be here because everyone we know is here. So we pretty much Cambridge doesn't have that much of a community anymore right. uh, in most spots. Um, so, uh, but it's been expensive, whatever. And uh, we, we look around at places, to my point, and uh, they're all paved to the, like every yeah. available little patch around every structure is paved. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, just on aesthetic grounds, it's gross, you know? Um, and the idea that it's based on the car culture is highly problematic. And then the idea that, that the paving is also uh, assisting the warming of the city, literally, you know, it's, it's not, uh, and, and there's drainage problems, there's a bunch of other problems. It's, it's been bothering me personally for a long time, so. Um, I, but anyway, I think that, that this would be great content. Anybody that can produce content, I mean, uh, journalists are, are not, I will not say lazy, but journalists are overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. the, the few people that get paid to do it now uh, in communities like this. And um, anybody that can pr you know, present um, usable content like you're proposing to do, I mean, that's, that's going to be a winner uh, because we can then just, it's just there, you know. Um, and uh, we can jump off that and do series, you know, awesome. on these issues. Yeah. Can I just say one thing? Um, this, I'm sorry, you didn't say this. <coughs> Somerville High School has um, clubs, like environmental clubs, mm -hmm. and this might be something that yes. students would be interested in. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I would s suggest reaching out to the teachers that, I don't remember the name of the teacher who runs the environmental group, but it might be a good resource to work with. <coughs> and the media group. I'm also on the board of the Scholastic Media Association. Oh, okay. And you can get lots of help from them, and they're eager to, eager to go <coughs> chase, chase new money with them for, for, for both them and for, for the schools and for others. Excellent. It's a good idea. Excellent. Thank you. Um, anything else on this proposal? Good. Really good idea. Really good, really good idea. Cool. Yeah, people digging the idea. Cool. Let's make it happen. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, the next proposal will be the man behind the camera, Brian Zip of Somerville Media <laughs> Center, who didn't introduce himself yet. Um, can uh, stand in front of the yeah, camera. Yeah, in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't need an operator. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brian Zip. I'm the executive director here at Somerville Media Center. Uh, feel free to call me Zippy. Uh, oh, okay. it's much easier to to remember. Um, you've all read the proposal. I just want to say, ultimately, we kind of view ourselves as um, as a platform. Um, you know, you were talking about video stuff. That's one of the things we do. We have a podcast studio. We have this studio, another video studio as well, um, with our membership <coughs> that provides access to 
um, said facilities and equipment for specifically for the purpose for providing a, a platform for getting this kind of stuff out there. I know in addition to that, we have sort of a, a secondary platform, which is our Somerville Neighborhood News um, uh, program slash product, uh, uh, what have you. But that really is sort of our pipeline for getting um, information from uh, members of the community shared with sort of the larger Somerville community writ large. And so we're certainly continuing to explore ways to get more people involved, uh, especially being more community facing, um, just because that's sort of the reality of you know, financially <coughs> speaking and everything else as far as uh, where we can get that kind of content to, to share with with um, with the rest of the community and, and those folks who, who have that <coughs> motivation uh, and uh, <coughs> specific affinities with various topics and so forth, you know, you know which stones to to uh, to turn over and, and, and the like. Uh, we provide uh, media training, both for audio and video, uh, for like podcasts and, and uh, newscast purposes and so forth. I know we've been working with Jason and, and Binge as far as kind of trying to bring the journalism writing side of that because regardless of the medium, it all goes back to, to writing, you know, being able to tell the story. And that's the thing is you know, we provide um, a lot of tools as far as the storytelling platforms for for getting this out. But uh, <coughs> if any questions, happy to answer that. But yeah, figure that should be a good encapsulation of it. And I know Jason, when he talks about the binge part of this, yeah. definitely about more the, the journalistic kind of facet to this. And you've got these four bullet points here that, <coughs> that I guess Erica Jones wrote out um, that are worth looking at, right? <laughs> Increase the number of members who volunteer to cover community meetings and stories. Uh, in order to achieve this, SMC would like to offer quarterly classes that focus on video, right? right? As you're saying, podcast production focused on storytelling and news gathering. Two, explore deeper collaborations with my group, Binge, um, to offer a broader community journalism school, apply for grants to keep costs accessible. Uh, this contributes to the greater uh, news garden model, which I'll be talking about, and allows for consistent educational opportunities and mentorship. Three, organize quarterly panel discussions, yet yeah, topical, and invite community dialogue. The, these can, these events can be live audience and recorded. And four, help facilitate connections between current SMC members with community journalists or other related um, community journalism organizations to cover content. So yeah, that's all. And definitely part of the whole platform thing is we actually have space. So yeah, I mean, exactly. you're meeting here here today, <laughs> um, and, and and that's that's certainly one of the things that we we try to do as far as it being a part of the, the greater community is making this space available for these kinds of efforts. So. And this is a problem in Somerville space, um, I think. You know, obviously, you all live here. But I mean, public space or public-private space that you can use for events, even of this size, it's not so easy. Um, and with, a, with the high school still in construction, you know, it's even harder than I think it would otherwise be, especially for working with young people. So having you know, the ability to use this studio and some subsidiary spaces in this complex are extremely helpful. Um, and we have a good pipeline. I know uh, we, we several of our folks are members of the, the broadcast club up, up on the, the hill for the high school and, and so forth. And so that is some of the, the, the other things that we try to, to leverage for content. Yep, Joe. One of the areas that I think we need more partnerships with are with TUS students. The TUS <coughs> Housing League, for example, is a very hot group <coughs> to be partnered with, to partnered in some of these activities. <coughs> And they've got skills, and they've got skills that could work well with high school kids and with and with and with others, and and they've also got time because their schedule. They could even you could even rationalize some of this stuff as a, as a, as, a, as a college project. And Tufts is in is in. Uh, I've talked about that too, but Tufts is in a highly vulnerable position right now. So that we, there are some resources to negotiate. Uh, great. No, yeah. I just want to say that three of the people that were trained here have been doing feeds to uh, SCAD mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> for the Union Square Neighborhood Council. Mm -hmm. And in addition, staff or volunteers have been covering some of our bigger and more important meetings over the last two and a half years. And I want to say that that's really been helpful. Yes. Um, and hopefully with this you continue to do that. Um, so, thank you. 
Great. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, in term, um, Scott always did a lot with the immigrant community and non English speaking programming. What's your thoughts about that and, and outreach efforts? I'd be really interested because I think it needs continues to be very. Uh, yeah, we. Uh, the short answer is we're always looking for more non-English content just because I know Somerville High School has what 53 languages spoken mm -hmm. kind of thing and we we have four that we, we <coughs> have on the channel English far and away um, the majority of programming but we do have some Spanish language some Portuguese language and some Haitian Creole language um, content and and that's one of the things that when folks come through for orientation that that's one of those gee whiz moments when someone talks about where they're they're from. Uh, we had a filmmaker from Venezuela, mm -hmm. and and that was like, well, we'd love to to do a show about filmmaking, but do it in Spanish. You know, and all of a sudden, you can see the uh, the wheels turning in their head as far as the the fact that because we are a non-commercial media model, you know, we don't need to justify. Um, an appeal to a large commercial audience, and so here's here's the this is the again from a platform standpoint, this is a platform that uh, embraces sort of the diversity of of the community as a whole, and really trying to give um, access for for uh, underserved voices, you know, to share with the rest of the community. I just want to add one thing. one thought on I don't know if you've ever done outreach with the Welcome Project, but they have do a lot of ESL classes, and some of their students are pretty advanced. Yes. And they might watch programs here, but I don't know that they would know that these things were available. So I would just do a little outreach here. Well, we know, we know uh, the Welcome Project well. Um, actually, one of our teen filmmakers, uh, Carla Cortez, um, ha ha did uh, an award-winning documentary on Ebi Sushi as far as it was a, a uh, profile, a migrant profile in terms of the head chef from Ebi Sushi um, is from, and I'm going to, I'm racking my brain to figure out which country from, from Central America, but uh, it was a really uh, <coughs> well done project to the point where it, it was something that we submitted uh, on a national level uh, mm -hmm. and it was recognized for its, uh, uh, the caliber of, of content. Thank oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> How cool. um, one thing I wanted to bring up is that I, I've observed that, um, like many um, community media stations, um, SMC um, doesn't get enough viewership. I don't think you know the, the the big cable company that that Somerville has, you know, Comcast um, doesn't. Uh, it, it it you know the stations here appear on its guide, but none of the show titles or times we don't get access to there it's very very yeah. bad um so i mean i think in, in the middle of all this we need to be thinking about ways to get more eyeballs on yes. screens here yes. um you know and part of that's community engagement which is ongoing anyway but but I, I think there needs to be i mean certainly on the part of my my newspaper dig boston and others that you know like someville journal and others we need to kind of stir that pot more uh, not exactly I just have a question. Uh, do you stream the programming, or is it only on the cable station? Uh, it is streamed on our, our website. Uh -huh. um, we are in the process of getting a Roku channel too. Oh, so okay. for those folks who are nice. who I have think that's cut one of the, the major ways the cord, yeah, more um, people and our, cutting the cord. Yeah. Our website yes. also has a, a lot of video on demand. So uh, <laughs> even the stuff that's not streamed, if you want to like watch something. Uh, that's a, an option as well, yeah, and then we have that. a pretty <laughs> uh, robust presence on uh, YouTube, just because we <laughs> we acknowledge sort of <coughs> where where things are going as far yeah. as as where media resides. We have a hand over there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, you can finish what you were saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah you're in front of the camera. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Has this gone all the way? No, around? it needs to go to. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I was. So happy that you brought that up because that was one of um, a topic I was really interested in uh, how about this whole event. Uh, the Commission for Women did a community dinner with Summer Viva, um, and Summer Viva provides. I don't know if everyone's <coughs> familiar, but yeah, so they provide a really part of the city government, and um, they have liaisons for the three languages that are most spoken in Somerville. Um, and in that community dinner, we we're just talking about what are the different needs within their communities. 
Um, and something that was highlighted was positive representation for immigrants. It just because even though people think that we're in this liberal bastion, unfortunately, it's <laughs> yeah. not it's right. not really like that. And people ground. are feeling, I mean, this administration has really, really negatively affected uh, the immigrant communities and just um, needing that positive representation, just hearing, and like Welcome Project is in, <coughs> would be an amazing partner too to find more of these stories. Um, and I think also, would be really powerful with that too, is just the fact that we're so focused on somebody being successful, like, okay, well, what organizes, organizations did they start? What did they do that? It's like, there are people who are doing incredible, <coughs> the stories from the immigrant community, what people have done to get here. I mean, it's incredible. Like, I, I just want to hear those stories highlighted. So I think that would be, I'd be really interested to, and I could do them in Spanish. I speak Spanish as well. Nice. I'd love to do, like, bring that. So, yeah, I'm very interested. Joe? Um, one of the effects of this, uh, one of the, uh, when I first moved to Somerville 20 years ago, I didn't realize how siloed it was. The silo mm -hmm. effect in this city is pervasive and overwhelming, and you're talking about exactly how to change it. Because <coughs> if people think, well, that's the way we do it, that's how we do it, that's the way it is, they don't realize how many options they have. And all of, I'll think, all of these programs deal with how, how to create new solutions to old problems. And those, those kinds of solutions have a resonance internationally, easily. So that I'm wondering if, do you have good data on, on, on your viewers from different <coughs> locations or regions? Absolutely not. We, we cannot afford the, the Nielsen ratings kind of thing yeah. for, <coughs> for that kind of thing. So. Um, we have lots of qualitative stuff just from... And I always get in trouble <laughs> with some <laughs> of the staff down here. Rather than some of the programs that we have produced in the past, which it's only 10 of their friends who watch that program. <laughs> now, we don't control that. It, this is what this organization is about. You join as a member, you produce your content, and if you only get 10 people watching it, but doing work with binge doing work with other journalistic types of endeavors is what we're going to start looking for and it's citizen journalists that we're looking to help us i i'll just jump in and um, we probably should move along gary's here we should do his proposal no 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 i'm just i'm just saying i when i get to my proposal i'll be mentioning um well i used to be a professor of communications and um um one thing about this kind of initiative that's great is that we can leverage the resources of a community, including all the all the very smart people that we have, all uh, mm -hmm. all the all the professionals we have, uh, to do stuff like survey the city, to to develop, to do research, okay, on the city, to kind of get around some of these obstacles. Like we don't know who's watching. Mm -hmm. Well, we can figure that out. Mm -hmm. I mean, social science allows us to do this, and we should do it, right? So I just I just want to throw that in there. And Wait, when can you have that answer? For me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the answer's here, man. I'm I'm here, and we, we you know we put down ten thousand bucks and you know to work on this stuff and blah blah blah. blah. But go ahead. Uh, my question is, if we had data, two things. One is, can we ta can we say how much Xfinity and RCN are contributing? And doesn't that w couldn't that be considered sponsorship as the old style of advertising? And hold and give them credit while we also hold them accountable. Sponsoring what? A scat. Hmm. Okay. How much do they pay each of them? And would they would they pay more without a, a mandate? They might. Don't underestimate okay. that. <laughs> well, they do it. They do it today. If if you've noticed anything lately. I'm not a geek, I don't, but I flip a lot. C-SPAN yeah. is now totally sponsored by Comcast. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Every program that you watch, proudly sponsored by Comcast. Yeah. Mm. My bet is that, is that they could be drawn into this more aggressively on that kind of a level. They, they could, and I don't want to go into the details, right. they could, but at the same time, <coughs> they're trying to chop our necks off. Yeah. The corollary of that is our <coughs> multilingualism, frankly, makes us, because it's on that medium, yes. international in impact. Yep. And that's why I was concerned about how many, re how, many, how many eyeballs we get in Brazil. The truth is, that makes a Somerville, a small Somerville stadium station really big. 
when, when some of those kinds of numbers can come out. <coughs> and the irony is, this is a great laboratory city anyway. The stuff that the, the neighborhood council is doing has real impact, could have real impact on Rio, okay? And the, the irony of that, just to capitalize as a punchline, is that the mayor's relationship with the, with the, with the, 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 with Audi a couple of years ago mm -hmm. made that context quite real, mm -hmm. okay? When Somerville and, and Rio and uh, <coughs> uh, Shanghai and Berlin were the cities of, tr the cities of the future, nobody talked about that. That's a big deal mm -hmm. for a tiny little city like this. Mm -hmm. And we that makes the medium part of the message. I mean, I will say we should move on, but there, there is a nuclear option that people of Somerville can deploy. It's called municipal broadband, and I've discussed it on the show with Joe before, you know, stuff like that, um, you know, where, where the city, you know, ends its contracts, you know, with, with companies like Comcast <coughs> and then, um, you know, deploys its own fiber system and, and deploys much faster and much cheaper, you know, everything, you know, TV. You, you, you were know, listening and, in this week? Uh, <laughs> Uh, on well, when I was on your show, I talked about I no. I've got panel. No, I, I wasn't. Two meetings that <laughs> did you have were held this week with um, the city side. <coughs> nice. About in the event that um, we are defunded by the cable companies, so those talks are ongoing. Yeah. Weekly. Uh, one, quick you think, one quick thing. One quick thing I'd like to <laughs> add. You should don't ignore on that is that the argument last year and twenty years ago for the transfer, transfer fee on, on real estate was a, for a lump of community investment mm -hmm. for benefits like that, okay? Because that makes it a more attractive city and generates more jobs. Joe, you know me well enough. I do. I'm going to every well that's out there. That's right. <laughs> so, all right, Joe, so I'm going to drop the hammer and uh, put, say, Gary, go ahead with your proposal. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think that, well, first I'll introduce myself. Oh, yes, please, uh, 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 I'm Gary Trujillo. And I've been involved with the Union Square Neighborhood Council for a couple of years, uh, even before it existed. Um, we had a planning group that met to work out uh, how we would um, go about doing what we're doing now. And f since, uh, as, as is said here, since December of 2017, we have um, been having regular meetings uh, on a fairly frequent basis um, to among other things, try to work out uh, a, a way to communicate with the master developer in Union Square, US2, uh, which has its eye on uh, quite a bit of land in the area and is now <coughs> working primarily in what we call the D2 parcel at the corner of um, Somerville Ave and, 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 and Prospect out here. And so uh, one of the objectives of this proposal is to try to share the workload uh, of um, recording our meetings and also help us think about more creative ways to engage the public uh, in what we're doing, make our activities known. Uh, we, we have Bill Cavallini here, our uh, uh, co-chair of the, of the group, who can, if anybody's interested, speak to the larger purposes of of uh, the Union Square Neighborhood Council. But I'm looking primarily to uh, find uh, helpers to um, both uh, do what's required to uh, record our meetings and, and make them uh, suitable for uh, uh, carriage on, on the cable as well as on our website. We have some videos on the website now. And, and also to help us think about, uh, as I say, more creative ways of um, doing programming. Uh, one of the people who probably a lot of you know, uh, Yvette Wilkes, who also goes by the name of Lisa once in a while, um, <laughs> has um, uh, become interested in the USNC fairly recently. She actually helped us. Uh, we had a community meeting at the Argenziano School uh, at the end of um, March and uh, she, she did the camera work for that. And she's very enthusiastic. Uh, she wants to, to help us find ways to be more uh, diverse and ethnically representative and also uh, find a way to get youthful energies involved. So, uh, so that's a possibility if people are interested in, in those angles maybe. You know, I, I think that, that Yvette wants to be uh, uh, part of this 
one way or another. So uh, that's pretty much it. Any questions? I'd be happy to happy to deal with them. Um, and you want to record more stuff that you all are doing, right? Basically, to put it out there. Yeah. Uh, right now, it's it's pretty much our our, our uh, bi-monthly meetings and uh, any any special events we do. For um, so for the bi-monthly <coughs> meetings, um, is so the agendas are all on. The, I'm not as familiar. I'm sorry, I didn't have enough time to review. Like, what is some of the just really quick, I know we're short on time, but like just really quick, some of like the big pushes in the Union Square Council right now. If uh, that's, I'll, sorry. I'll, I'll bounce that one to Bill because I, I think he's, he's better qualified to answer that question. Um, I'm on the negotiating team with the developer. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there were enough, a couple of um, community benefits agreement summits held over the course of a year and a half, and they determined priorities for the community to be negotiated with the, with the developer. Um, they cover a, a whole host of, of issues, everything from <coughs> affordable housing, um, jobs with a livable wage, union involvement in the construction, um, high road employers for the permanent jobs, uh, sustainability, everything from passive house construction uh, to um, solar and um, and dealing with the fact that we're, that this development is mostly being built in a floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's for sure. Uh, parking, traffic, all those issues are on the table and have been negotiated over the course of the last nine months that we've been meeting almost weekly. Um, we we don't know how close we are to a final agreement. It's probably a few months away, um, maybe just a couple. Um, so I don't know if that answers. No, your that, question. that does. Thank you. And um, is it possible to um, through like some of our media center to get on the radio too, or is that? Yeah, I wasn't sure if like the Somerville like Media Center has any connections there, or if that was something that we do done separately. Because in terms of getting to other people, like yeah. the radio could. I think that's the kind of idea that I was I was thinking about in, in general terms. <coughs> that's one that hadn't actually occurred to me, but but you're bringing that in. You know, if if you would be willing to help us think that through, how how we could do it, how we how we could staff it, and uh, what what kind of format it should have, be happy to talk with you about. Yeah, no, I'd be interested that to idea. talk because also in the immigrant community. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just no, really, no, no. you know, in the immigrant community, I know the radio has been <coughs> really helpful in getting messages out too. So uh -huh. that could be sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is another thing that that needs to be looked at in terms of some research. Um, you know. How do people get their information? Mm -hmm. And then you've got to reach people on those channels or encourage them to get on other channels that they weren't on before mm -hmm. through education efforts, outreach, that kind of stuff. So it's a community organizing effort. Um, but um, uh, it's also, th this is where, so I, I should have I said at some point at least, we've been convening the journalists that were involved in this project separately now, right, to try to coordinate better, right? That's just starting. And it's not like there's a ton of people, right, or a ton of outlets either. But the Somerville Journal's involved, you know, we're involved, others are involved. Um, and um, this part of this, again, comes down to producing, you know, getting uh, packages of information out in different media that can then be picked up by journalists, you know, and mm. put out wherever they can put them out. We definitely, ha I mean, Somerville definitely has like people that work at WBUR living here, stuff like that. For example, if you're talking radio yeah. uh, and other stations as well, you know, and there's, and, and, and Somerville Media Center absolutely produces audio, you know, through Somerville Free Radio and through podcasting, you know, the podcasting, you know, studio over here and stuff like that. Um, so that that's, and, and you can always rip audio from video anyway. So if you're just shooting video, you could take audio and do stuff with it. So there's plenty of opportunity for that. There's plenty of opportunity, obviously, for video. And then in terms of um, text, you know, that's kind of falling more in, in, in my wheelhouse, you know, in, in for the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism to think about, you know, different ways to get text out there. 
But um, um, I think it's an important thing to think about how we're going to aggregate the information that different groups are producing and, and get it out, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, so Bill, just and thanks. And throw this out there. Uh, I think it would be really useful at any point in time, even after conceivably after a community benefits agreement is negotiated, that there be a debate between hmm. uh, the community and the de developer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that be highly publicized and maybe repeated. Um, maybe there be a two or three phase <coughs> debate, uh, depending on how the first one went in terms of viewership and so on. Um, <coughs> because um, one of the things that happens is that um, in the public arena, the developer rarely is seen um, and heard, right. um, and and <coughs> and even more rarely um, questioned mm -hmm. and challenged. You know, they they are, and this goes for small developers as well, <coughs> not just <coughs> transformational developers like yeah. RIT and US2. Um, but a guy like Elan Sassoon, who's doing all kinds of residential developments in and around Union Square, gets a free pass as to, except for these <coughs> small community meetings right. that people have, that the ward counselors call, and you know, yeah. a dozen, maybe sometimes if you, you, know, you get two dozen. And, and it's really, there's <coughs> no debate, there's no back and forth. Right. Um, and I, I'm just putting that, I don't want to take any more time, but just to say that that, that would, that adds another level of um, discourse that you don't see anywhere, I don't think, um, except maybe in the news talk column of the Somerville Times, <laughs> which right. is pretty, some of that's anonymous, it's not, it's not a real, and the developer's never in there, of course, except maybe in these, uh, you know, sham fronts mm. that they put out, the, um, the astroturfing that they do. <laughs> so, um, I, I just think a debate would be a, 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 an important addition to the kind of just covering meetings stuff that Gary's talking about, which is important. Um, so, there's a lot of the people that, that, that have come to one or two or more meetings that then follow the, the issue through the, the news coverage, um, the video coverage that, that Gary's been facilitating. Um, links? Yeah, that's an incredible idea. Um, uh, back to the um, radio idea and the recording of the <coughs> meetings in general. Um, I think it would be good if there was some sort of highlights reel whatever medium that was in, like a three minute video, audio, writing, or all three of those. So someone can just be on their commute to work or washing dishes and just get a three minute summary of that week's meeting. Yeah, great idea. Sounds like a news program. Well, yeah. <laughs> no. Actually, just to, to follow that up, when I when I read this, I wasn't quite sure. Um, you said tasks would entail video recording of bi-monthly meetings and occasional special events. <coughs> does, that, does that mean the intent is to put the entire meeting on you know on the web somewhere for people to to view if they so choose? Pretty much, because we're trying to operate under the open meeting law, even though oh, we're yeah. not formally bound by it. So it's just kind of a record of everything that transpired okay. at the meeting. But I think it would also be good to, to do an excerpted or or uh, a condensed version of the thing to, to make it more watchable. Because a, a, a lot of the stuff we talk about, and I'm, I'm sure Bill will agree with me, is very boring and goes into detail that probably would be difficult for a lot of people just tuning in to follow. So if we can find the <coughs> juice, juicy bits and, and, cr and create maybe a half hour uh, program, I think that would be great. But again, it just takes more energy than we presently have. Yeah, so just just to quickly follow on, I mean, yeah. you obviously you then have to be comfortable with everything that's being said in that meeting being public and everybody has to probably sign waivers saying, you know, when they come into the meeting saying, you know, I'm okay being recorded. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't if it's a public yeah. event, that's not true. I mean, you don't yeah. have to sign waivers. That is true. Okay. So can I just jump in on that one thing? Yeah. Coverage of those meetings oftentimes 
um, you lose your viewership if they go beyond a certain amount of time. Yes. And if there's a lot of dead air and a lot of passing yeah. of microphones yeah. and, yeah. but the, a word of caution to anybody who's thinking about that spectrum of how to cover the news in the city, once you get into editing programs, you could fall into the same trap that other folks are in, is right. that you are <coughs> coming at this with one point of view right. rather than yeah, trying, yeah. To dispe right. trying to get your information yeah. across. So in my experience here, I do, I, Brian laughs, I try to have a weekly show yeah. where I bring in people of note who are ahead of these projects. Mm -hmm. So, so far, let me just say that US2 has declined my offer of a half hour interview. Federal <laughs> Realty has declined my offer. <coughs> um, the head of the MBTA Green Line Extension has been on the show twice. Mm. So he has no fear that I'm not gonna sandbag these people but the reason that I think some of them come on is because it is an unedited show. Mm. What <coughs> I ask them, if they choose not to answer the question, yeah. they're the ones who look bad. So, sure. Gary, I love what you're doing, but you have to be careful on the editing part well, of the show. I, I think that as part of our team, we need an advisor who has the wisdom of, of yourself. Oh um. my God, you are in <laughs> trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's important to have a repository of meeting video yeah. is what, what, I mean, for journalists certainly, but for the public also. And then people can go to it at, at their leisure and, uh, or when they need to, and mm -hmm. it's just there. Right. Yeah. What's the deal with the government channel, Brian or, or Joe Lynch, you know, like uh, in this city, like how does that happen? Like what meetings get recorded and what ones don't and where, where do they end up? Either. I, I'm not part of the decision-making process on how they do that, but from what I've seen, um, a lot of that will come from the council itself, the city council, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. formerly Alderman, right. is that you have to stay in touch, your special interest part of this <laughs> has to stay in touch with those elected officials right. that are going to push communications, because communication... Look at the number of meetings that go on in this city right. every week. Sure. They cannot possibly <coughs> cover every, every meeting. But between the education channel and the government channel, with the limited staff that they have, right. I think they do a great job of covering all meetings that have, are required to be <coughs> under the open meeting law. <coughs> they also have a brilliant way that they've constructed that if you're looking for a specific part of that meeting, you can go in, you don't have to watch the whole thing. Oh, nice. You just fast forward and you go right into it, especially with council meetings and mm -hmm. school committee meetings where there's an agenda. Sure. You click right on. But the government channel itself, now let me just go back to the comment that I made before. It's not just the public side of what we call PEG that is at risk. It is also the government channel in this city and the education yeah. channel that receives their funding to do their broadcasting and their programming yeah. through Comcast and RCA. So all of it is at risk if the Trump administration gets their way with the FCC. So I, I don't want to scare anybody, but our meetings, this one with me, one with Brian and myself, with the mayor and the communications people, is the commitment is made by the city of Somerville to keep this place operating. Now it's up to me and the board to figure out how we move forward. Right. Binge has some great ideas that they've been contributing. But let me just say it again. You have to be cognizant of the resources that this place has and the resources that Binge has. So the more concise you can be and the more clear you can be about what you want us to do, <coughs> the better off we all are. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Anything else on um, on uh, Gary's proposal discussion? We can move along then. Ellen, uh, with the next proposal. Right ahead. So I put two items on here. The first one I will talk about is traffic and noise pollution. Um, STEM, uh, the Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership, has worked with the Tufts School of Medicine and Engineering since like 2006, and we actually approached 
um, a professor at the uh, public health program at Thompson said, you know, we have this air pollution problem in Somerville, and there's a N National Institute of Environmental Health Service grant that we'd like to go after. Would you be interested? And the professor said, yeah. I, look, I mean, he looked, I mean, say initially, he looked over what we were <coughs> proposing, and he got very interested in, we ended up working with him and bringing Chinatown in Boston into the project because they have even worse air pollution because they have <coughs> I-93 yeah. and the Mass Pike. Mm. Okay. And a piece of Tufts is located. And they're right in the right middle of Chinatown. The and health. they have all the downtown traffic. So we've been working with the Chinese Progressive Association, Chinese Resident Association, um, and we actually worked with the Boston, uh, there's a, a, a nonprofit that works with Boston Public Housing, and they were an initial partner, but um, our work has kind of taken us away from there. So we continue to work with those groups, and we have gotten some research grants, and over the years we have collected some amazing data. It's, we have a website, which I posted here. Um, we look at a different type of air pollution than is typically reported. It's nationally and internationally, people look at what's called PM 2.5. <coughs> it's a regional pollutant. And it, there's measures, the World Health Organization, everybody looks at it. What we're looking at is PM um, ultrafine particulates, which are smaller than PM 2.5. You can't see them. Um, and they're not regulated. Right. Mm -hmm. However, and they and they only affect people who live near the source, because once they get out about 200 meters, they turn into BM 2.5. And there's other <coughs> other parti particulate uh, there's gases and other particulates that affect people at this close range. So this is what we've been focusing on, and. Um, it's an environmental justice issue because most people who live near these sources are low-income people and they're minorities. Mm -hmm. And in Somerville, um, it's very interesting. When we first got inter interested in this, it sort of came out of the work we were doing on the Green Line, where we looked at unexplained deaths due to heart attacks and lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And what we found was Cambridge, which is right next to us, mm -hmm. had lower than normal deaths. Somerville and Chelsea had higher. <laughs> and Somerville never had a high smoking rate. So it's like, what's going on here? So that's how we kind of got interested in this issue of, you know, the, this localized air pollution thing. So we've done an enormous amount of research. We have good data. <coughs> we can talk about it. And we actually work really closely with the city. And it's been very interesting, this process, because Every time a developer comes and wants to build near a highway, we show up at the meetings and we say, what kind of ventilation systems are you going to put in? Mm -hmm. What kind of windows are you going to put in? And now the city realizes, because they're sick and tired of it, they want to work with us to figure out what can we say to developers going forward, you want to build here? This is what you have to do. Um, so we're in a good place with regard to that. But we don't have good data on, uh, there isn't a lot of research done on what in, in um, inside ear pollution reduction systems work the best. Mm -hmm. And we are now embarking on a new project starting probably this summer to put um, uh, air filtration systems in people's houses mm -hmm. to do some measurements. Um, we also have been working with some, some developers um, <coughs> around testing. The, we have a grant to, with HUD to test the air, air pollution inside some of the newer housing being built in Somerville. Interesting. So we've got some really great projects going on. And we, if someone is interested in working on letting the world know about this, we would love to do that. So that's why I didn't go into a lot of detail here. Because if someone's really interested in getting into this, I would want you to sit down with some of our more technically <coughs> oriented people. I am a social scientist. I'm not a atmospheric. Chemist, I've okay. been following this. You're working with Doug Brugge. Doug Brugge, a John Durant Tufts from Tufts, yeah. and um, actually Wig Zamor, who is a member of uh, STEP, right. is mm -hmm. probably one of the world's most knowledgeable non-academic people about this. He's yeah. brilliant <laughs> in this. Yeah. So we have some great people, and um, so we would be more than happy to work with anyone who wants to come in and talk to us. We have a lot of data on our website. What's interesting, and <coughs> I just want to share this with you, we've just f 
finished doing some major work on noise pollution mm -hmm. um, because that was something people were really concerned about. They wanted to put noise barriers up on I-93, mm -hmm. which should have been put up when the highway yeah. was built. You know, I noticed Ted Hills has those. That's kind of right. funny. Right, well, yeah, let me tell you, this goes back, <laughs> if, if I have a minute, I will tell you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you guys may know about this. Cool. When I-93 was built, there were people who were fighting to have it built. They didn't want it built, like just like they didn't want the inner belt in, in Boston. Right. We lost, they won. <coughs> we got the highway, we wanted it, they wanted, they at, said, well, if you're going to build it, build <coughs> it below grade, which would have been much better. Mm -hmm. They said, no, we're going to build it above. Yeah. And then they tore up East Somerville, right. yeah. destroyed the community, which was a vibrant, so, you know, economic community. And it's only in recent years that the immigrant community in East Somerville has brought the community back as an economic <coughs> yeah, right. force, which yeah. is wonderful, <coughs> but we're still living with the results of that. So we did noise <coughs> testing this year, and I don't want to go into long detail, but there's an interesting story about Mass DOT and our wonderful new um, representative, Mike Connolly, who got some money to do some testing. Um, we have a lot of support in the community about the, how to address the noise issues. We've done um, testing, we've done a community charrette, which is bringing people together to think about ways to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that in the, in the States Avenue in Somerville, um, noise, uh, noise barriers could be really good, and we have some great designs. For Mystic Avenue, that's not gonna be a good solution because mm -hmm. you can't put them up <coughs> I mean, you, you don't want to build walls around people's houses, and even if you did, it might not be very good. So we have some other ideas about that, and some of the new research on air filtration we're looking at are ways to kind of get to some of those issues. Um, it's very, very complex, but we, we really want to work with CUNY, and what's interesting now is the National Institute of Environmental Health has funded our research. Now it's up to us as advocates to take on the next step, which is, what do we do about this? It's not, we can't rely on federal funding for that. That's, that's a community effort. We are partnered with the Welcome Project. They have been working with us on this research, and um, we will be working with them. Um, they, are, they have been, uh, Ben from Welcome has worked really closely with folks around Foss Park, and we looked at Foss Park. We have some really exciting ideas that we want to share with people, and we want, but like <coughs> the, the Foss Park has a group of really strong advocates. We don't want to take the initiative away from them. We want to support anything they're doing to mm -hmm. make it better. And we have some resources that, you know, data that we can share with them. As far as the Mystic Avenue area, we have great support from our legislative delegation. They want to do something for the whole area. So this is like a win-win opportunity if we can get resources to address it. And it's a great story. Um, and also, just from the perspective of West Somerville, I just want to share one thing. Um, uh, Katiana Ballantyne, our city council president, lives over in your neighborhood in West Somerville. Route 16 is a real problem over there, too, for mm -hmm. this air pollution. And we haven't done any research over there, but our data suggests that, you know, it's a problem over there, and we, you know, people in that neighborhood should be concerned about it. So the more we can get this information out to people and get people engaged in figuring out approaches to improve it in, in their houses, we would do that. And I just want to, the last thing I will say is, I get calls from people like, should my kids play out in the yard <coughs> during this time of day? And you know, I mean, this people have really practical questions that they're asking, mm -hmm. and we would like to work with people who want to help us get that word out. And you also mentioned GLX in this proposal. Yeah, I, that's the second thing right. that I want to mention, which really ties a little bit more to the Union Square stuff. Okay. I love Ellen dearly. I've been <laughs> member of staff for a long time. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Well, I'm, you know, it's funny. I, people say to me, how did you get into this? I said, well, I never thought. I'm a sociologist. I worked in transportation. How did I ever get into this? It just, I fell into it, you know. But once you get into it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that um, from what Ellen has, has been talking about, uh, particularly working with other groups, uh, one of which she mentioned, uh, this is something exciting about this kind of uh, coming together is being able to recognize in the efforts of other people who are, who are putting together projects like this uh, something that uh, is, 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 is tangent 
to or maybe overlaps with what, what we're doing. So something that I, I didn't mention uh, with regard to the Union Square area uh, is um, there is a, a potential health problem associated with the plan that US2 has put forward, which has what they're calling a uh, open space right adjacent to Prospect, where there's a lot of ve vehicular traffic with the noise and the, the pollution, the stuff you're breathing in. I actually took part in the Tufts study that was happening up by Assembly Square that, that, that Ben Echevarria was uh, uh, managing, and I think WIG had something to do with that as well, WIG Zamor, who, who Ellen mentioned. Uh, he is one of the people who is, is trying to find a way that we can develop the, the D2 area that does not have those health risks associated exactly. with it. So, so I guess what I'm coming to here, I, the other person to mention is Tim Tallon, <coughs> who I know made a, a presentation right. to STEP. Uh, so I think that maybe it makes sense for us to think about doing some collaborative presentation about those, those uh, issues that in, involve both of, of, of our interests. And, and the other thing, of course, is, is the MBTA, the, the new, new T station and its, and its <coughs> access. That's, that's not the health issue, but it's, it's uh, particularly for people with disabilities being able to get down to the station platform. That's, that's uh, a health issue. Well, yeah, it, it, it is a health issue as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like your idea, and we should talk later yeah. about this. Um, let me just, can I? Another yeah, I want the, the green line issue that I brought up, it relates totally to this. And um, <coughs> how do I say this? I, I have been working on the green line stuff forever. And I'm like kind of sick and tired of it, to be honest with you. Because, you know, we've been through so many iterations. Um, but I want to just say one thing. When they built the red line through Somerville, you know we have two entrances in Davis, right, on two different mm -hmm. sides of the street. One of them serves the buses primarily, you know, people coming, or people coming up from mid, mid Somerville who are going on the path. The other one serves people west of Davis from Cambridge all the way, you know, in that side. It is one of the most heavily used stations on the system. Okay. When they built that station, they estimated maybe 20% of the ridership but they built two entrances, okay? Now they're building the green line. Now, granted, they don't think light rail is gonna serve as many people as heavy rail does. But you know what? <coughs> they're building it so that it'll work on the day it opens, not on the ridership that's gonna be <coughs> there when they have it built out for housing and commercial development. Mm -hmm. There are gonna be a hell of a lot more people trying to get on the green line in Union Square. Mm -hmm. And they have one entrance, it, and it's, it's, it's in terms of people with disabilities, that's a huge problem, but can you imagine all the people coming up Prospect, or people <coughs> having to, to filter into that station? Yeah. It's <coughs> ridiculous, and from a, it's, it's both a health issue, but it's also you know, a long-term decision, and it really appalls me that that has not been taken into consideration very well. So that, that's where I, I think getting a news report out on this issue of what the potential ridership is going to be because the T always underestimates anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, at least they did the right thing in Davis and built two entrances. So uh, that's the first part. I live in East Somerville and my station will be the one at, at the uh, Washington Street Bridge. <laughs> and that station has been, they were going to originally put an elevator there as well at the bridge. And now what they have is this very long um, um, uh, ramp. Ramp. ramp, I mean really long ramp, up to the station. Great for the ice in the winter. Yes, right. <laughs> who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna keep it clean and safe? What about safety at night? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there's a senior housing building that mm -hmm. is like the closest housing to that station right now is senior housing. Many of the people in wheelchairs, they're not going to go up that ramp. Mm -hmm. And I am appalled. Plus, there's going to be all this development at Interbelt. There are plans now to build three new, um, two apartment houses and one hotel across the street from the Holiday Inn. 
which is great. I think it's great. <coughs> He's a good developer. I, I, I like the plan. But you know, the ridership's going to be there. Why are we building something that is not going to be functional in 10 years? That's my question. You know. We well, I, yeah, and so I, I don't feel like this fits in anywhere. <laughs> so, so, but I wanted to say that you know I'm I'm here in the chair of the the community action agency of Somerville, and so when you when you bring up the welcome project, I, I want to jump in and say we're here too. Yes, I know. You know, yes. and that we serve um, really low income families in Somerville, and we have the Head Start program, and we have over <coughs> 270 kids in our Head Start program in Cambridge and Somerville. I think that things that you're talking about in terms of pollution particularly is has a real impact on a lot of the families that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, also, our families are really vulnerable. We have the, um, the Homeless Prevention Project also where we work with people who are being evicted and you know our, we have advocates that go to court with people every week. Um, so we, we're really in touch with the, with the very low income immigrant community and you know we have a lot of access to people. So I just I wanted to put that out there as again you know yeah we're here <laughs> we we do a lot of um, big work and I, I think you know sometimes we kind of get lost in the fray. So good plug. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know where to put it. <laughs> um, if, uh, so I guess I just, okay. One last thing. The two things that I'm, I, I I presented are very different. The, the the air pollution thing is more complicated and needs someone who wants to jump in and really get into it. The other one is really like. Kind of, a, I think, a more flashy story to support some of the work that Union Square Neighborhood is doing, to kind of take another look at, you know, the design and maybe push even US two because they're the developers. So I. Okay. Uh, just a quick comment on the first one on the, um, on the air quality. You know, I mean, you, the way you frame it as an environmental justice issue is, is powerful. Um, the way to pitch environmental justice <coughs> stories to reporters is to talk about the people who are affected. And so, perhaps, uh, perhaps instead of leading with data, if you if you actually have someone who can speak to you know the health issues that they've experienced or their children have, ex have experienced as a lead, that may uh, that may more immediately grab some attention. I know it it can feel a little exploitative to you know put forward someone from the community as as a victim, uh, but but just I guess bear that in mind. <coughs> I mean, speaking <coughs> speaking as a freelance journalist, like when you mentioned that you got into this because there were a wave of sudden deaths, yeah. mm -hmm. like that's yeah, they weren't sudden deaths; they were un unexplained, unexplained deaths. Unex okay, unexplained deaths, deaths that but like didn't fit the data. Right, so like a mysterious pattern emerges of people mm -hmm. dying. Right, like that's that's a more compelling hook than we have 10 years of data. Although, like, as an ex-scientist, I love 10 years of data, right? But, like, <laughs> Good. Um, I'm aware that other people aren't as nerdy as I am, so. I think, that's, that I think both of your suggestions are really helpful. And I think what we, what we need for that stuff, for the, the, the air pollution and noise pollution, is someone who really wants to work on getting a little bit deeper into it. I mean, I think the ideas of bringing in community people who I think would be very interested um, you know, I, I think there's opportunities there, but I, I you know, it's, it's a different kind of story than the, than the, the, the uh, Green Line Access story. Um, just yep. one more thing on the Green Line Access thing. Um, I, I'm sure Ellen knows this. She was a former board member down here, and formerly I was with STEP, so we're all kind of like this one big happy family. Right. Anybody who's doing a story and anybody who's going to try to pitch and anybody who wants to do their own thing, we have an enormous resource down here of footage. Mm. Oh, so yeah, don't right. feel as though you have to go out and start refilming everything. Brian and his staff down here have a repository. Yeah. So if you're trying to figure out what John Dalton is saying about the Union Square ADA issue, yeah, yeah. you go to the interview that I did with him following your websites, knowing that was an issue, and I asked him directly about it. So, uh, Green Line, we have an enormous library of Green Line footage, including the current construction that's going on in mid-May. <laughs> Brian, increase your insurance. Um, <laughs> Brian and I and a film crew have been granted access <coughs> to the right-of-way by the Green Line uh. constructors. 
So we're going to be traveling from station to station to station, actually on the right of way, uh -huh. with guards and hard hats. And <laughs> we're going to be doing a lot of the filming to show people the before and the after. That's just putting it out there. You need film footage. It may take a while. You have to be concise in what you're looking for. You may have to go through the footage on your own, but we'll pull it together and make it available. So we'll, um, we're running a little bit late now. We can, if people don't mind going 10, 15 minutes over, we can finish up. Uh, I guess I'll do my the proposal from Binge next. And I will read it for the camera primarily so people can hear it, but I mean, I'll, you, know, um, you can all follow along. Um, this is the Somerville News Garden proposal from the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. Um, since its founding in 2015, the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, a regional investigative reporting incubator and media education hub, has been working closely with the Somerville Media Center on a variety of television productions and training workshops. Over that time, we became aware that Somerville was one of a large number of municipalities in Massachusetts and across the nation in danger of becoming news deserts, areas that no longer receive sufficient coverage from functioning news organizations. Concern that Somerville could easily lose most of its remaining news outlets without swift community action. We called the February 16 Somerville Community Summit to start a conversation between residents and journalists and the journalists that cover the city in hopes of sparking joint campaigns to increase the amount and quality of local reportage. Immediately after this successful 120 plus person summit, Binge publicly committed to spend $10,000 toward the furtherance of that goal in 2019. <coughs> and we are now ready to launch the, launch the project that those funds will support the Somerville News Garden, SNG, although I don't actually say SNG anywhere else here. Um, the idea of a news garden is aspirational. In a city that has uh, been losing solid news coverage over the past quarter century, we now propose to help reverse that trend. The metaphor of a garden is particularly apt, we feel, because in addition to signaling the opposite of a desert, it provides a us a nice framework to approach the work at hand, which is, it must be said, very much like the hard but fulfilling work that many Somervillians put into uh, community gardens. The Somerville News Garden will, and here, here go the funny words, uh, survey the news outlets that serve the city, cultivate those outlets through coordination and collaboration on both the editorial and business sides, till the ground of community awareness with public education, sow the seeds of new news outlets, water those seeds with money and community support, harvest the new useful community news coverage and increase collaboration between local news outlets, new and old, that results. All with the goal of growing the garden year by year until Somerville has the best news coverage it can have, while spreading the news garden concept to other municipalities under threat of becoming news deserts. The Somerville News Garden will actively recruit a membership of volunteers called, what else, gardeners, who will make the project go. Binge staff in close consultation with Somerville uh, Media Center staff will continue to play a convening role and will accompany the effort in, in an advisory capacity. And folks interested, for, for those of you watching this, to join the News Garden in this early phase can simply email me, Jason Pramas, P-R-A-M-A-S, at jason at bingeonline, B-I-N-J online dot org to sign up and get on our mailing list, our email list. So a um, couple things here I would just flesh out a little bit more is that I already mentioned that we want to do more um, research. We want to coordinate research. That's an important first step, um, you know. And, and there's already been a, my mind's kind of racing as I as I do this because of what everyone's been saying. I'm like, oh, we got to do that. We got you know, we got to jump on that. We got to do this. Um, also, on on the public education side, um, we've been doing, as Brian mentioned, you know, uh, work with SMC here. We've been doing, like for example, we're doing quarterly workshops, our community journalism 101 workshops, to like help start training people that may not have ever thought about being journalists, doing journalism, you know, to be able to do some reporting, right? Um, but we want to do, mo we want to do more than that. We want to start a school, okay, and, and do uh, short courses, four to six weeks is, is our initial thinking, and uh, have four or five of these courses running at once, and, you know, cite them here at Sunwell Media Center, and ideally elsewhere in, in town, you know, where, where it would be good to do them. And uh, we also need to think about doing them in languages other than English as well. Um, that's going to take some extra effort and money, but we do, I mean, you know, we make a good point uh, on that. And um, the, the major immigrant groups are, are, are definitely being invited to these events, so we're going to have to work harder to pull people in and pull in, you know, like groups like uh, tenants organizations from Mystic and other places where there's a lot of immigrants, right? Um, but the courses are, 
are going to be, you know, yeah, we'll continue training reporters, but we want to do it better. You know, not just do kind of the 101 thing, but do 102, 103. Do, um, you know, uh, media analysis courses, media sociology, you know. Do also formal training courses of a type that may not already exist here at SMC, or if they do, we'll just pull those in. Um, and uh, we think that that will, that will help matters uh, to get more people trained, you know, uh, about uh, how to produce media, but also about media, about, you know, how it works, what its function is in, in democratic society, that kind of stuff. So uh, any thoughts on this, folks? Uh, Ellen? I really like the idea, and I would actually be interested in, when I was an undergraduate, I was a communication major, but cool. I kind of <laughs> drifted <laughs> off. So I, I would like to, to um, Teach? I, I'm very, I'm, well, I'm very interested in this. Um, and I also had this idea that could be really beneficial for community organizations. STEP has a great website, and it's, we have it done, done in such a way that from the very, b we have <coughs> archived it so that you see the current information first, but you can go way back to like 2006. What would be great, and I think this for all the organization, like a lot, I hate, I kind of hate social media. I can't keep up with it. I mean, I just <laughs> can't keep up with it. It's too, too much information for me. Uh. And, I, and I think of what Bill White said at the last meeting, which is when he was growing up in Somerville, <coughs> There was the Somerville Journal, and everybody right. looked at that. And right. today, there are so many sources mm -hmm. that it's really hard to figure out where to look. Yeah. So one thought that I have is it would be really great on the STEP website, on your website, on the Union Square Neighbors website, if we could even put news on our website related to whatever kinds of things that are getting published mm -hmm. or getting broadcast or on social media yeah. that we could put back for people to look at. Like our website gets looked at a lot by people interested in transportation and air, air pollution. Right. But <coughs> so we could do that. And I think it, that's a way to also think about what you're trying to do, which is educate people, but also to kind of put it back to the, to the community that the advocates are serving. Well, this is the aggregation function on, in the journalist meetings that we have to explore more too. <laughs> but like, it's eminently doable to have a feed that people can stick on their websites. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's different ways to do it. I mean, it could be as simple as a Twitter hashtag and then you mm -hmm. just follow that particular Twitter hashtag. Um, and then no matter what your website's built on, you'll have some app or something that you can plug into your site pretty mm -hmm. easily that will just display it, you know. There's other ways to handle it we can talk about. But, but that's very important um, because we, we do have, aside from the siloing effect that Joe mentioned earlier, we also have a, a fragmentation, right? And also, and I mean, most, especially, well, this generational, like, divides also, right? It's not that older people don't use social media. They, they do, you know, in various ways. Um, but they continue to read, like, newspapers, watch TV news, listen to radio news, stuff like that. Um, younger people... It's, it's pretty much phones, and it's pretty much like whatever their friends are posting on social media or whatever the social media is feeding them, you know, for news is what they get. A lot of that news tends not to be about And, and the when they can. Right. It's the it's matter of random. convenience. Yeah, right. on the way to school, in class maybe, whatever. But yeah, and I mean, they, um, but a lot of the news isn't about here that they're seeing. It's about, like, yeah. what's this star doing today? Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, oh, what did that Trump do? Or, you know, right. okay. I mean, that's all news. It's, you know, people have a right to look at what they want, obviously, but um, we need to get um, more information in front of more people from here. That's that's part of the trick, right? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop, but what else do folks have to say? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I really love this idea, too, and think that there's also a potential to, um, in terms of like, I mean, there's amazing like local musicians. Like I loved like Dig Boston having cliff notes and him like talking about, you know, the hip hop scene in Boston and how racist it is and like bringing up these, but also, so like, I mean, there's people like him, there's like Monica Cannon Grant from Violence in Boston who does really incredible work. Now more, yeah, we've and, covered her, yeah. yeah, and just like these people that I think are really inspiring to hear about and like that, are way cooler than like <coughs> you know hearing about like the same celebrities you hear about so like right. how do we lift up and like tell these stories of this 
I mean, there's so many creative, incredible people here, and I think like we want to be covering the hard news, but also making sure we're covering like these like really inspiring things that are happening, and Absolutely. also organizations. I mean, CAAS, like the work you're doing, the Welcome Pro. I mean, all this amazing like work. Like, if we could yeah make it more engaging for news, I think would be. Yeah, I don't want. I mean, I'll, I'll sorry. Go ahead, Joe. Sorry, Jason. I got I got to fly at some point, but right. and yeah. please, whoever's left, who's left. Somebody's left. Oh, wow. There's one more presentation. Joe Beckman, oh, yeah. call me. Give me your presentation I'll, over the phone. I'll wrap. I, I want to say one thing about how all of this is shaping up under your guidance today is that what I'm hearing is that there is a call for a news program that people can go to. Maybe sure. it's a half hour program, maybe it's a 15 minute program. The highlights of living in Somerville this week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then there are more programs that you're pitching, which is more an investigative type of magazine yep. type program or a three-part series program. Yep. So there's a lot of terrific ideas that are coming out. The one thing I just want everyone to keep in mind is we're going to be your community partner, but it has to fit what we're doing down here in terms of the resources and the number of <coughs> folks that we have. So the more concise, the more solid that pitch is through Jason and his cohort, the more we can be right behind it. I, I can only do maximum three shows a week down here now because I've got other stuff. But I mean, doing business with Binge is probably the best way that we can figure out mm -hmm. to keep that news cycle going on a weekly basis, on a bi-weekly basis, however we do it. Arts coverage, we try our best to do a lot of arts coverage down here. It's the investigative reporting and that ongoing news mm -hmm. cycle that we can't dedicate four people yeah. a month to do. So that's where all of you come in. Yeah. And we love it. Um, I will be giving everyone homework. I'll email you all and ask you to give your thoughts from the meeting and it, so we just have them because I'm worried about losing, although we're recording it, you know, I'm worried about losing, you know, snippets like that and stuff. Um, so that we can, um, as we plan, as we move along, you know, we'll, we'll capture these ideas and start to work on them. Because they're all pretty much sync, syncing up with each other nicely. Anybody else? Okay, you're going next. Or so. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me from this discussion is that one of the biggest problems in Somerville is, it, is, is to know when things are happening, calendars. Yeah, and, and, and if we can, if we can get the message out to everybody you know to consolidate their calendars someplace on, on your page, on some page, on your page, somebody, because there's too, there's <coughs> there's too much redundancy, too much too much competition, and it's <coughs> not really competitive. It's just oh, I got to go to both of them, mm -hmm. and that happens much too often. I, Preaching yeah. to the choir here. I got a second nine second different feeds to find out where I'm supposed point. to be. <laughs> Fifty years ago, I consulted with the New York Times on how to use school, newspapers in schools. And their observation at the time was, current events takes too much time. <laughs> Which is a serious problem that we're now facing in Indi on a local level, even worse in some ways. I mean, that's actually a, a great project, and uh, the city could even be pulled in on that one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Probably should, actually, mm -hmm. as long as they agree to be pretty open about what they're willing to put on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, anybody else? Yeah, Gary. Yeah, I, I just uh, am wondering whether y you might be thinking about or be open to the idea of having a meeting where we can go into more details about what you're describing so that, yes. I mean, th there, there are a lot of questions that occur to me. Uh, such as um, what you're willing to do with regard to <coughs> maybe sponsoring or at least encouraging and finding a place for some uh, group that, that has a particular angle on the news or a particular kind of um, set of interests, such as what was men mentioned here about artistic kinds of uh, activities and, yeah. you know. So, so I'm, I'm hoping that you might be willing to have another meeting just about what you plan to do. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, and I should say, I'm, I guess, uh, I'm a lapsed artist, and that might be one way to put it. So <laughs> I, my, my terminal degree is actually in visual art, which is mm -hmm. quixotic if you know me, because I never thought that would happen, but it did. Um, but um, um, I said in the initial uh, email on this meeting that um, I, this is because of my politics. <laughs> you know, like, um, 
which I guess you could describe as left libertarian might be a good way of putting it. I don't, uh, I didn't want to sort of privilege my organization in this process. I view it as an organic citywide process, right? And it should be that people feel like, okay, I have this idea, I want to do this idea, and everyone else should know about that idea through our network and then be able to work on that idea, another idea, whatever. But I want to do that in this meeting at least once before um, I start calling meetings specifically for the Somerville News Garden, which I'm going to do, yeah, of course. Yeah. Sure. And then um, uh, just to make sure that there wasn't, you know, we, and I, I know we didn't hear from everybody in this meeting, you know, uh, and we can have other meetings like this too, just to keep, you know, regularly, just to, to keep the ideas flowing so people feel yeah. empowered to just come up and say, I have this idea, and then we might all go, wow, that's the best idea we've ever heard, we need to do that, right? We wouldn't have heard that idea if I, if I stepped right up and said, Okay, let's all do my thing. <laughs> you know, that's, right, yeah. that's all. Um, so yeah, we'll be we'll be doing that. Okay, great. Uh, and we'll be doing a lot of art stuff. <laughs> that's there's been a, actually in the initial meeting there was a ton of arts groups that participated, yeah. probably more than any other sector, yeah. which is very good. Um, and it says that the, it tells us that the art scene here is still very much alive despite gentrification. Yeah. Um, you know, otherwise we're all going to be doing these meetings in Medford, you know, in another five <laughs> years. Right? So <laughs> not to diss Medford, you know, we won't be talking to Medford. But, um, <laughs> So, Joe, why don't you do your thing and finish I'll up. try to be brief because you should know that I'm, I'm focused on uh, housing. And housing issues, I think, um, are, are solvable with documenting how to solve them. And the part that's most interesting to me is, as, I'm, as I turn 75, is, is aging in place with millennials. And what occurred, to, what happened as I began to do this my, myself, is I got more involved in the pilot discussions with Tufts and and about Tufts. And the part that became very, very apparent is that the silos had kept everybody apart, and they didn't. There was there was every reason for people to work together. That. That then led me to discover Nestor League, which was a program that MIT invented, where, C where, where, where grad students at the time at MIT uh, were trained to be caregivers for seniors in return for cheap rent. Very nice, good, simple concept. That works very well. <coughs> I'm old, but I'm not that old yet. But eventually I will be if I survive that long. And it would be very nice to have somebody help me. And I, have an, I own my house and can do that. That led me to condominiumize my house. The paperwork is breathtaking. I imagine. That then led me to refinance it, which is in still in process, and it's only been three years. And that led me to see how could we replicate this process by documenting it. Now, the part that's interesting is that it's really not that hard to document. It's quite easy. But at the same time, if we can incorporate the, the, the technology at the same time. We can simplify the process too. And if we can incorporate the diversity of the city, which we have, we can also use equity as a means of creating equity. Home equity to produce community equity. And it's not that mysterious. I will be able to house a grad student from, my, my, from Tufts for free. As long as they help me take care of my house and me. And that kind of a deal then led to <coughs> discovery, did, led to the pursuit of the <coughs> pilot problem. I don't know if people really are aware of how serious a problem that really is. I discovered in the course of these committees, one of, many, one of a whole batch of a whole other batch of committees, that Tufts pays two, 275000 a year to the city of Somerville instead of paying taxes. Well, they pay $2 million to Boston mm -hmm. for the health service. That's a big disparity. But it's even worse because half of what they pay Boston is services by grad students who are paying tuition. So that there's a real serious gap. That then got much worse when we discovered that only 5 to 7 percent of the seniors and juniors at Tufts, at Tufts University live on campus. That's a huge number that don't. And this is not that big a housing market for that money to be dumped into the city with no support. And then we discovered that Tufts is increasing its enrollment by 100 <coughs> kids a year for the next three or four years mm. to make more money. Right. 
which is an absolute disaster, because again, in a in a in a city which which has which has such a fragile housing market, they've got to do something. And that this partnership for seniors becomes a really important vehicle for them, very important vehicle for them, because the seniors in Somerville need help. We are a substantial population. We are growing the second fastest growing demographic in the city. And if we can get that help, it can help Tufts, it can help their students, and it can help us all at once for very little money over time. <coughs> and that led me to, again, I think I may have mentioned, to the Tufts Health Plan Foundation as a pot of money which is able to do the planning and the coordination and the collaboration. That's where I now stand. That, that proposal, the first of those proposals should go in in, in in July. And I have to figure out what partners to have and how to go about doing that. The second, which is for a substantial amount of money, <coughs> could go in in September. And that can be for a three or four year program. To, to pilot, to train, to develop, to document. And whether it be mostly on the re in, in, in the media, the documentation, or whether it be mostly with the training, Depends. It's all up in the air. But the truth is, there's a lot to do. And Tufts is very, very vulnerable. And I don't mean to capitalize on that vulnerability. I mean, frankly, to help them capitalize on that vulnerability. The silos that I mentioned are worse there than they are here. Because they have, there's much for us to teach them and much for us to learn from them as, as partners in a wide range of things. <coughs> That's where that, that is. Okay. Any discussion? Yep. You know, I, I, I had not known about what Joe was proposing, but I, I thought about this issue a lot. I, I think that there are a number of seniors, I'm a senior, living in the city. <laughs> who, I live in a house. I have a 10-room house. <laughs> I could house. So I've thought about, you know, when I get older and can't function, that I might want to bring someone in and, you know, and, and do that. I can't really afford to move because I have a tenant who pays my mortgage. <coughs> you know, my, my housing expenses are pretty reasonable. My taxes are high, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the point I'm making is that I can't, there's no place for me to move that I can afford. I mean, I, it's cheaper for me to stay in my house, but it, I'm overhoused. And I think that there are other people in Somerville who are in this situation. So I think it is an interesting <coughs> story. I've talked to other senior pe people who also want to, you know, um, you know, remain in their homes. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you know, some of them own, you know, two family houses. Mm -hmm. They rent their mm -hmm. renter, you know, have, you know, have renters. There, it is an opportunity to do some good things, and I think to address, you know, a student population in a way. I mean, students. You know, how college is so expensive now, mm -hmm. it would save them money. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities here, and I think it's an interesting story that you really haven't seen very much. So I, I kind of am intrigued by it, and I think that it would be appealing to old, the older population in Somerville mm -hmm. to see more about this. I don't know that millennials necessarily, but younger people who might be in a position to want to take advantage of it and become a caregiver might be interested as well. As so opposed to spending 10000 a year yeah, on yeah. housing. Well, this yeah. is a great, obviously, thing to do stories about. I mean, everything that people have said are great things to do stories about. So that we will do, we will do that, obviously, with Dick Boston, and then I'm sure other publications, bigger ones, will and outlets will come on board. Um, I, I should ask. Uh, I think Richard and Lynn haven't really said much. You all want to say anything before we wrap up about stuff, or not to put you on the spot? But uh, no, I'm just I'm here to hear your stories and hear ideas. Rudy. Right. Anybody else? Okay, I just want to say one quick thing. Since it's not here, the um, URL for the uh, for our website is unionsquareneighborhoodcouncil.org. Great. Okay. So you can just make a note and, and take a look, and it'll it'll give you some information about who we are and what we do. I should say for the camera that we, you know, uh, if you go to binge online, the website of my organization, binjonline.org. Uh, we have all the proposals from today mm -hmm. up there okay. and people's emails for contacting them and signing up, you know, to work on different pro uh, projects. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to add really quickly, too, in terms of, like, potential for reporting as um, 
that the Somerville uh, Cambridge Health Alliance's Public Health mm -hmm. um, agenda released the 2017 Wellbeing Report in Somerville, and that has some really interesting data points like for poverty levels that 43.2% of families with a female household female um, householder and no husband present, no partner present, had incomes below the poverty level, um, and s uh, a 2.6 increase since 2010, and it's s s significantly higher than the rest of the state. And there's also a statistic around um, the rate for females visiting emergency departments for mental disorders has been rising consistently, huh. and especially has seen in the senior citizen population, and the fact that also um, in the well-being report, it was just highlighted, just in general, like um, a need for more community and going back to what you're saying about silos yep. and people being lonely yep. and not just, I mean, all different ages, all different. Yep. So I think that, yeah, just pulling in that we have some really incredible resources in Somerville that have this data that just needs to get pushed out there more too. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you.